Father, thank you so much, Lord, this morning for the opportunity for us as a church body to come together to worship you in unity, to worship you in truth, to worship you in spirit, Lord, to come before you and to worship you through examining your word, to, to see how you're speaking to us, what you're saying to us. Lord, I pray that you would be with us now. Please be with us this morning as we study this beautiful command to be baptized in obedience to you and following hard after you and, and giving our lives to you, Lord, and laying our lives on the, on the altar as our spiritual worship to you. Let us know your presence now. Illuminate our minds. Show us these truths, Lord. Give us good discussion. Pray that you would not leave us to ourselves in this time. In Christ's name we ask. Okay, so what does baptism mean? What does generally the word baptism itself mean? Anybody know? Immersion. Immersion. Okay, so the Greek word literally means to immerse or submerge, uh, to make whelmed, you could say to make fully wet in the reference of baptism with water. Its very essence, baptism, the very essence of baptism means to immerse. So is the only is the only time that baptism is spoken of about water in scripture? What are some other things that's spoken of? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, fire. What did you say? Salvation. So we'll look at one text in particular um, on the representation of baptism. But baptism does not always, if you look up every use of it in the scripture, it's not always in reference to water. Uh, sometimes like. Like Zeke said, uh, it's speaking about the Holy Spirit, and there's a differentiation there. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, I believe, makes a very clear differentiation between baptism of water and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, so baptism itself means immersion. Uh, and so when we baptize, in a couple weeks, God willing, we'll be baptizing James and Isaac, uh, and when, when we do that, we're going to have... What is it out there? We have a horse trail, right? The Grace Community Church infamous horse trail. I like that. Uh, we'll fill it with water and we'll baptize them fully immersed into the water and bring them up fully out of the water. They get wet. I get wet. Everybody gets wet. But they're fully immersed, brought under the water completely and brought completely out of the water. And so I wanted to look at a few texts which make this clear that baptism is full immersion. You can make the argument strongly from the word itself. Um, and this is in light of some uh, denominations saying baptism is simply a sprinkling. Um, it's just a little bit of water on the top of the head. It's not full immersion. Uh, but I just want to go into very basically and essentially uh, baptism means full immersion. And why does it mean full immersion? Turn to Mark chapter 1. We'll just look at a few texts here uh, to get a basic definition, really, of, of what baptism is, or the sense of immersion. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. So you say, why immersion? Why do we immerse people fully in baptism? Why would we um, stand by that as, as the way to be baptized? And I believe there's a strong case in Scripture for it, aside from the Word itself. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 5. Can someone read that for us? And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and there Jerusalem, and were all baptized with him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, so you have all Judea, all Jerusalem, going out to who to be baptized? John the Baptist. And what does it say about their baptism? They were baptized by John, by him, where? In the river. In the river, in the river Jordan. Doesn't say alongside, doesn't say next to, it doesn't say by. It says they were baptized in the river Jordan. What does that make clear? That they went into the river. They were stood in the river. 
It could have easily, the word here could have easily been next to, by, aside, but it's specifically in. And then look down at verse 10. Someone read verse 10 for us. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. So John and Jesus went into the river and they came up out of the river. They didn't come from next to the river. They came up out from it. So they were in the river. They came out from the river. We'll see this language utilized uh, in the book of Acts as well. I think I have that down here. Let's see here. Um, Acts 13. Why don't we go to that now? Go to Acts chapter 8. Uh, we'll look at it now. But it's clear, this, is, this strongly suggests immersion as opposed to sprinkling. You have them going into the river to be baptized. You have them coming up out of the river. If you look in Acts chapter 8 and fill up with the, um, the Ethiopian eunuch. Look there in verse 34. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or someone else? Here, here Philip's opening up to him the scriptures and showing Christ. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. So there's strong suggestion. I mean, there it's clear. They went down into the water. They came up out from the water. So we see that baptism is clearly, from these texts, full immersion. And so you say, okay, that's a strong argument in itself. Further turn to Matthew chapter 3. We'll see that this was how Jesus was baptized. Let's stay in the Mark 1 text as well. Matthew 3. Three sixteen again just when Jesus was baptized immediately he went up from the water. And behold the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Jesus Christ was baptized in the water, he came up out from the water. Now you say, Well, is this just our English translations or how could this the, the Greek words used here are very clear. There's very specific words used. They easily could have used the words next to, aside, by, but they specifically use in these contexts, in the water, out from the water. So there's a clear denotion that they were fully immersed. Um, and then this is also how the disciples baptized. Uh, turn to John 3, verse 23. And again, this is just a brief overview of a few texts here about why there's full immersion in baptism. And this is where I was going to use the Acts passage. We could use this again. This is how disciples. So we look, as we look at how we ought to run the church, we look at the apostolic example, right, of how did the church do the ordinances, how did they go about church life. And we see Philip with the Philippian or the Ethiopian eunuch going into the water. Here we have John in John 3.23. Um, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. Water was plentiful. They needed a lot of water for a lot of people to be baptized because it, it wasn't just a little sprinkling of water where you could take a little jug, but where, why did they choose where to go and be baptized? Because water was plentiful there. This will suffice. We can go and baptize here. Okay, one more, and we're going to look at this text again in a moment. This is a little transition for us, but turn to Romans chapter 6. Let 
Romans chapter 6, verse 4. All right, let's, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were bur buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When you are baptized, what's the symbolism happening there from this text? Born again. Okay, it's born again, but in terms of the symbolism of it, what's, how is this representing our new birth? Us dying. Okay, our death. So what happens in death? Buried. You're buried with him, right? What ha what do you do to someone who's buried? You don't you don't leave them. You either fully put them in the tomb, or in our day here, we fully put them, lay them in the ground. We cover them completely with dirt. We immerse them in the ground, right? We cover them. They're fully submerged, immersed in the ground. And then he says, "You were raised with him." What's that a picture of in baptism? How do we represent that in baptism? Christ, Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection, and we bring the person out of the water, right? If we leave the person in the water, they die. They stay there. This is a, a picture of going fully down into death and being fully brought up, being resurrected with Christ. So these texts clearly show immersion. When the person goes down into the waters of baptism, they're symbolically going down into the grave and being buried. Coming up out of the water is a picture of being risen from the grave. <coughs> and sprinkling misses this. Yeah, go ahead, brother. I just do one thing on that. Being Absolutely. Buried. I think we, we, we think about it and it's really fast, but when we think of somebody being buried, that's because we're dead, right? Yeah. We're dead to the old life. There's there's death, real death that's taking place, symbolically speaking. In order for the new uh, born again believer to come up, I, I think that we have to really look at fact that if we're identifying with Christ and we're dying, so we put off the old us and we're being resurrected to the new life. All things have passed away, all things have become new. There's a huge significance there that I think it's easy for me to over but anyway, thanks. So how how then just briefly though on that, because that's a good point. What weight ought baptism to have? You know, in our society, sim symbols of um, culture have become nothing, really. I mean, you look at the very symbol of marriage and what that is, and it's just, you have, okay, you have this new definition of marriage where a man's attempting to redefine marriage. But on the other spectrum, you have people who are married six, seven times, get married for a month, divorce. It just has become nothing. You know, it wasn't always so in this country. You aren't always able to just get divorced like that. You need to have a reasonable cause. Couldn't just say irreconcilable differences, okay, fine, stamp it, divorced. They need to say, well, why? You've entered into this union, you've made a covenant. Why is this covenant being broken? Well, in our day and age, these covenants, these uh, symbols, they're just quite insignificant in the world. So why does this sit, and we're going to talk about it a little further, but that's a great avenue to go down. Why ought this to be so significant? As you two guys are going to get baptized, why is it so significant what you're doing in this symbolic picture before your family, before the church, before the world? Why does that carry such significance? And you hit on it, on the one aspect of it, which is you're really, you're saying, I'm the old me, dead. He's gone. He exists no longer. Which means when you make that declaration, you're coming into, you, you're then held accountable saying, wait, you've just made this public declaration that your old you is dead. How are you going on and living like the old you? I thought he was dead. Oh, well, no, that was just a, that was just a, you know. There's significance to it, right? I mean, you're professing before the Lord and before his church, before the world, that that is not me anymore. I, that's dead and gone. I died with Christ. When Christ died, as sure as he is risen, he certainly died. And I died with him. There's weight to that, isn't there? 
this isn't a flippant, uh, flippant little exercise of the church. Okay, then let, let's look then a little further into that, what, what the baptism represents. There's two representations uh, of bapt or two things that baptism represents that I had here. Um, you tell me, what are, what are some things, I have two here that baptism mainly represents from scripture. What is it that baptism represents? We've just been talking about one. I mean, well, we've mentioned dying to our old right. ways. We're dead. We're no longer who we used to be. Right. That's one thing. Right. And and we could put that perhaps um, by saying, okay, we've been united to Christ. So it's a union with Christ. Baptism represents our union with Christ. In what two ways are we united with Christ? His okay. death and his resurrection. His death and his resurrection. So we're united with him in dying. He died. We died. The old man's dead. But we don't stay dead. Jesus Christ conquered sin and death, conquered the grave. We then are risen with him. Baptism represents our union with Christ. That's essential. What's another thing baptism represents? Yeah. Um, like, um, just as water represents the outside of the body, like, baptism, like, represents that we've been cleansed, you know, by Christ's blood, and we, we, you know, like, it's, you know, the water is, is just representing, the cleansing of the water is just representing the deeper thing that's happened, with us right. being purified by Him. Absolutely. So it's, it, it represents the washing away of our sin, right? Turn to Acts 22. Let's look at this. And this is, if, if we're speaking of those who will defend the sprinkling of water in baptism, this is what they'll say. They'll say, baptism represents the washing away of your sins. You can wash away sins by just cleansing with the sprinkling. You wash away the sins um, in that way. And so they would seek to defend sprink, the sprinkling in, in baptism with washing away of sin. And it is true that baptism does represent that. And we'll see that, but I would argue, and Scripture, I believe, makes very clear that it's more than that. But look there in Acts 22. Um, let's start in verse 12. Can someone read verse 12 through 16? And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. Keep going. Yeah. For you will be a witness unto him, a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. What does he tell us there about baptism? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Is he talking about physically the, the water washing away the physical sins of the people? No, it's, it's a spiritual representation. We see that in 1 Corinthians 6. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 6. And this here ought to be, especially in our day and age, a text that we as believers use often in, when speaking with unbelievers, when speaking with those entrapped by the lust of the flesh. Someone read verses, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. <clears throat> or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11 to. Yes. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed, you 
you were sanctified. This is a phenomenal sentence right there. We start at verse 11. Such were some of you. As we were walking in our sins, we can say, once was I. But I what? I died. The old me is gone. I was that. What happened? I was washed. I was sanctified, I was justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And so the blood of Christ as the washing away the filth of our soul, the filth of sin, is represented in baptism. We are washed clean. And so those who, who are in, in uh, rather view of sprinkling would say that's baptism. That's its representation. And that's it, um, as far as my present understanding of, their, of that position uh, at large. But we believe Scripture teaches much more than that. It does represent something more, and that is, as we've been talking about, our union with Christ. Do turn back to Romans 6. We'll look at this one more time, and then we're going to look at a parallel in Colossians 2. Let's look at this one more time. know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him, there's our union with Christ, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. There's our union. We're united with him in death. We're resurrected with him in life. Turn over to Colossians chapter 2. We'll look at this. Colossians. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Can someone read Colossians 2, 11 and 12? <clears throat> In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Having been buried with him in baptism, there we are, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. So baptism represents our union with Christ. Um, the, the idea of just sprinkling here completely misses this representation. If we are going to be true to the Word of God and true to this ordinance of baptism given to this church, the, the church, the command given to us in the Great Commission, if we're going to be faithful to Scripture, we've got to be faithful to the reality of what baptism represents. Which is why infant baptism, which is why we believe in believer's baptism, believe and be baptized, how can, if this, if baptism is representative of you dying, your old life dead, your new life being raised, if an unregenerate infant who has no knowledge, has no capability, has no understanding of the gospel, has not put their trust in Christ, the old man is alive and well, how can they enter into this baptism? If you remove this representation, this aspect of baptism, then you're really free to, to open it up in a lot of ways, which is what happens with paedo baptism um, But I believe the symbolism is clear. I believe the teaching from Scripture is clear, which is why we do full immersion in baptism, which is why these two guys will be fully immersed in their baptism to show their death and their resurrection. Is that clear? Any thoughts on that before we move on? Okay, why don't we move on to baptism and how it correlates to church membership. I want to look, there's a few texts we can look at, um, but I want to look 
Uh, someone turn to Romans 12, 4 and 5. Someone turn to 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and starting at verse 12. So someone read Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to, uh, to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion or... We didn't say that. Four, right. four, or five, four or five. Sorry. Four. We're gonna get you're gonna get us into prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so four or five. For as in one body we have many members, the bodies do not have all the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. So we are united to Christ in our baptism. Therefore, it is also a visible sign of our union with the church body, which is only visible in the, the body of Christ, which is only visible in the local church. So the, the body, if we're united to Jesus Christ in, in his body, in baptism, well, what's the visible body of Christ in this world? It's the church. That's called the body of Christ. So if we're united to Christ in baptism, then we are united to his body with the local church. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Clarification of this. 12. Let's read um, 12 to 27. It's a bit lengthy, but... Someone have that? Yeah. For just as the body is one and has members, has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, each the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Okay, so there the picture of the church is portrayed as a body. The body of Christ with different parts, different functions. And as we are baptized into Christ, we become a part of the body of Christ, right? We become members of the church universal, but here in this context, the church local. We ought to, and we'll see in a minute, the Great Commission, but we become members of the body of Christ. And so this is just to say that when, when we join in union with Christ in baptism, this is representative of our union with Him, that it, it draws from that that we are united to the church, the body of Christ, universal and local. And so there's ought to be a correlation with our baptism being joined to the church. That's why people get baptized and enter into church membership. Um, because it seems clear that when someone's baptized, they're not just some indis or alone, loner out on their own, but they become part of the whole body. And where is that visibly represented? Where's the body of Christ visibly represented? In the local church. So that's one aspect or one way that um, baptism correlates to church membership. You become joined part of the church and the local church. Uh, any thoughts on that? 
then let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at the Great Commission. Matthew 28. And I believe from here it's clear that those who are baptized ought to join themselves to the local church. We'll look at Matthew 28, and then we'll look at an example of this or an outworking of this uh, in the book of Acts. But someone read Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Please. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the command is go make disciples. After making disciples, what happens? Baptize. After baptizing them, what happens? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. Now where does that take place? In the church. In the church. He's not saying baptize them and then sit them down for 16 and a half hours and teach them everything I've said and then send them on their way. Saying, and we'll see this in a second. We'll turn to Acts chapter 14. But this is the progression. You go out, you preach the gospel to all the nations. You make disciples. Those They come, they profess their faith in Christ. You baptize them. And then they continue on. You continue teaching <coughs> to all, to observe all that Christ has commanded. Let's look at this practically worked out in the church. Turn to Acts chapter 14. Fourteen, nineteen. I'll go ahead and read this. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel, there's a great commission, right? Preaching the gospel. And had made many disciples. There's the first line. Now we don't see here the baptism, but you can presume that they obediently followed the Lord in baptizing those disciples after they had preached the gospel to them, after they were saved. After they had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So, baptized disciples, those disciples here following Paul, what do they do? They appoint for them elders in every church. These disciples, who we know or can say from this text they've, they've, they're following the Lord they've professed faith in Christ they followed the Great Commission though this text doesn't explicitly say baptism, we can certainly presume they were baptized disciples and what do they do? They are appointed elders in each of their churches by Paul and they continue in the church, in the local church and so the, the follow up from baptism is to enter and join the local church and to be a part of the local church. We've been looking at, our brother's been looking at Ephesians chapter 4. And where is it where if we're commanded to be taught or the disciples to teach all that Christ has commanded, where is it that that's taught? Our brother's been walking us through. It's in the church. But what gifts have been given to the church? That would make that clear. Shepherd, teacher, teacher, apostles, Shepherd, prophets, teachers, apostles, evangelists. prophets, evangelists. 
These gifts have been given to who? The church. The church. So if we're to obey the Great Commission, preach, make disciples, baptize, teach them. That teaching element, where does that come in? Where does that come into play? In his church. In the local church. So it follows that upon baptism of these guys and any others who come in, they join themselves then to the local church to fulfill that action or that command in the Great Commission. Okay, let's look at the pattern of the early church. Go to Acts chapter 2. Look at this briefly. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. Can someone read those two verses, please? So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the, apostle, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So verse 41, those who received his word did what? Were baptized. And what happened then? Added to the church. Added. You say, Michael said added to the church. They were added to the, the body of believers. And then what did they do? Verse 42. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the church. The, the teaching of and the fellowship. I'm sorry? The teaching and the fellowship. The teaching and the fellowship. They devoted themselves to it. Look down at verse 47. Second half. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Added to whose number? Just random people around? No, there's a specific group. There's a church there, and he's adding to their number. We could go through Colossians and see a couple examples of this, of, of talking about he's of you, he's not of us, in terms of different churches and differentiation. We don't say um, that someone's, oh, someone was added to your church. We say, oh, what, who? Oh, no, 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 I'm talking about the church in, in Riverside, California. They were added to, oh, no, that's not our church. That's the church universal. But their church, he's talking specifically, he's added to your number. He's added, added to their number. This is the local church. Okay, so baptism, how it correlates to church membership in following the Great Commission, it follows on the heels of belief, baptism, join to the church. Um, we won't look at it this morning, um, but there is, Paul assumes in the New Testament, when he's talking to believers, he assumes that all Christians are baptized. Which is another argument you say about talking about the age of these young men. Some people will say, well, let's talk about the age issue. Um, Paul, in Scripture, assumes that all believers are baptized. If there's a credible reason to believe that person is saved, if they have, a, if they have an understanding of the gospel, they've entrusted themselves to the Lord, and there's nothing in their life that you're saying, I, that looks really bad, that's not the fitting of a Christian. It seems clear through the Great Commission that they are to follow in obedience and be baptized. Any thoughts on the baptism and how it correlates to church membership? Before we move on. Alright, I want to take the last few minutes here um, and just ask, look at one text um, and ask the question about salvation. Does baptism save? Ezekiel is shaking your head now. Why no? No, it's it's a symbol of, of what's happened. It's not doesn't lead the action to happen. It's a symbol of what already happened, and that's regeneration and, and trusting and repenting, trusting God and repenting from our own way of life. From sin. Okay, turn to First Peter, chapter. So you see, no, it's a symbol of what's happened in the spiritual realm. Baptism itself does not save. First Peter 3, verse 21, beginning verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, 
when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism now saves you. What is he saying there? It saves you. <laughs> Kathleen? Um, actually, I was reading this the other day, and um, I was like, I, I had read it lots of times before, but when I was reading it the other day, like something came to me, and I was like, wow. Like, because I think um, the key to this is it says, like, baptism, which corresponds to this, and then it goes back up and it talks about. Noah and talks about his family and being in, in the ark. The only reason why they were saved from that flood is because they went into the ark. And so, like, you know, we're saved not, you know, by the water, but we going into Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to Him for our safety. And right. so that's what that's talking about. Right. Yeah, it's, it's correspondingly saying baptism. As, as they were saved by entering the ark, baptism now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, not by the mere waters washing over you, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. If you go to um, well, I'll ask you this. What does it mean as an appeal to God for a good conscience? What does that mean? Turn to Hebrews 9. Let's look at Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will the blood of Christ purify our <coughs> conscience from dead works to serve the living God? An appeal to God for a clear conscience is another way of asking the Lord to forgive you of sins and to give you a new heart. This is not running to the waters of baptism to cleanse me physically, to take me to do some magic and cleanse me. This is an appeal to God. This symbol of representing what has happened what in your death and your resurrection, it's an appeal to God for a clean, to give you to forgive you of sins and to give you a new heart. So there, Peter makes a distinction. He says this is not this is not the physical removal of dirt from your body. This is spiritual. This is you turning to the Lord. This is you looking to the Lord, making an appeal to the Lord. Jesus Christ, by your blood, I'm trusting in you. It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are saved. Not the physical washing of the body. Further, last text here, Colossians chapter 2. We'll go right back to that. And I'll just make a point there. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, we looked at it earlier. Verse 12. having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him, through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised Him from the dead. How is it? Here He's talking about baptism, and He's saying you were buried with Him in baptism. Here's that symbol, right? Death. How were you raised? How were you saved? What was it through? Was it through that physical act of baptism? Through faith. through faith in the powerful working of God. It's through faith you are saved. The inward exercise of faith 
of you looking to Jesus away from self is represented by this baptism. The baptism itself is not saving you. There's no magic in the water. You are saved by faith alone. An example of this is in Acts chapter 8. Let's go back to Acts chapter 8. And I just want to show us an example of this where baptism did not save. And you look at Simon the Magician. Look there in verse 10. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. They're talking about Simon the Magician here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But when they believe Philip, so here the people have been looking to Simon, believing that he was the power of God. Philip comes preaching the good do news, doing works, and it says this in verse 12. When they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Simon the magician, believed, was baptized, continued. But was Simon the magician saved? Look down, verse 19, 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Was Simon saved? Did his baptism regenerate him? Absolutely not. Peter looks at him and says, Repent and pray, if possible, the Lord save you. He was in a horrific state. Baptism did not save. <clears throat> what do we know of the thief on the cross? He wasn't, There's, he wasn't baptized. He wasn't baptized. There's a case where he wasn't baptized and he was saved. So baptism, look at this. I want to show you this. Um, what time is it here? We've got a, a couple minutes. Go to 1 Corinthians 1.17. I want to show you something that's absolutely massive in our understanding of this. If baptism is necessary to save, look what Paul, the Apostle Paul, does here. He makes a distinction. If baptism is necessary to save, what is it part of? Part of salvation. What do we call salvation? When we go and preach the power of God. Gospel. Okay, gospel, that's gospel. what I was looking for. I was fishing here. We're preaching the gospel, right? The gospel is the good news of salvation. If baptism is absolutely essential to save, what is it a part of? The gospel. The gospel. It's an essential part. You can't have gospel without baptism if it saves you, right? If you can't be saved without baptism, you have no gospel apart from baptism. Watch Paul, 1 Corinthians 1. 17. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. If baptism saves you, how can Paul differentiate between the gospel, which is the good news of salvation, and baptism? Couldn't. And he, yet he says, I did not come to baptize. I came for the gospel. Is that a hand raise? No, I was going to ask you, um, what does that mean exactly? Not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Is that like trying to... What he's saying is, I'm not coming, yeah, I'm not coming in, in this, this fancy words to try and convince. I'm coming to preach Christ. Jesus Christ crucified. I preach it boldly. I preach it plainly through the message of the cross. It will be a stumbling block to some, folly to others, but to those who are saved, it's the power of God for salvation. I don't come having to entice with words and have eloquence and smooth speech as if I'm the one 
upon which the burden is to convince and bring in, I preach the gospel. What a relief that is to a man like myself. Anyone who dares preach up, stand up to preach, I don't have to come with eloquence. I come and say, guys, here's Christ, here's the cross, here's the gospel, and the Holy Spirit accompanies it and saves. But here we have a clear distinction, gospel and baptism. They're not one and the same. Baptism is not an essential element of the gospel. It's an essential element of obedience to Christ in the church. These two young men are seeking to obey Christ by baptism. But are they saved apart from baptism? Absolutely. Just as Simon was saved, with it, was not saved with it, and the thief on the cross was saved without it. Okay. Um, well, that's kind of a flyover, but I hope that gives us a little bit of grounding and at least some scriptures even to chew on in these next couple weeks and to know a little more when we come and see these guys baptized, what is it they're partaking of? What is it that's happening? Why do we do this still 2,000 years? Like, why are we still putting people in water and bringing them out publicly? What's the purpose of this? Uh, so hopefully that gives us a little bearing and a little foundation with which to work. Any closing thoughts before we close the first study? All right, well, why don't we pray? Father, thank you so much. For the gospel, Lord. Thank you so much for giving us Christ, with whom we can be united in his death and his resurrection alike. Lord, I pray that these two young men, as we plan to baptize them in coming weeks, Lord, would follow you to the end of their days, that they, along with each person in this room, would sing the conqueror's song marriage supper of the Lamb. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.